morning, brethren. Happy Sabbath to every one of you. Happy Sabbath to the ones that are listening to me via this, me- this media. It's a great privilege to be here with all of you. And um, just want to touch on something today that brought my attention um, in the following weeks. Um, and pretty much, you know, I was thinking about this topic. And, you know, it brings to my attention that everybody has gone through this at some time, right? Um, so, you know, the thoughts come to my mind and I start thinking, you know, since God is good, right? We always hear since the beginning when we were little, uh, God is always good. There are circumstances no matter where we at, you know. But sometimes, you know, we go through things. Uh, we might not have uh, this and that. We, are, we might be bearing a suffering from a family member. We might be having issues personally in our family, you know, at work, our, whoever we interact with. Um, and those things are bearing us. Those things are, you know, those things are making us, you know, just are delibitating us, like in a way that we don't, you know, we tend to struggle and we tend to start doubting the Lord. We tend to start thinking, you know, is this the right way that I'm going? Why is everyone not having the same issues that I'm having? Or why I'm like, I'm barely standing up and I'm, you know, I'm still... Am I trying to follow the Lord, or, you know, is the Lord with me, or what's going on, right? I mean, and, you know, and I always start thinking, you know, what if I would be able to understand or ask any person or any leader out there, what was their perspective of life? What is their perspective of life? You know, if you ask major presidents, Barack Obama, uh, the the president of the General Conference, uh, great men out there that, you know, did great things. What is their perspective of life, right? Um, obviously, I concluded that all of them have different perspectives. All of them have slightly or huge different perspective of life, uh, different, different ways of looking at life, right? Um, and I found that, that if you'd notice, I didn't even mention God. I didn't even ask about what is the perspective, what, what's God's perspective of life. Uh, so this problem confronted a man in Psalms, Psalm 73. I would like to just touch on that chapter the whole, this morning and just dig a little more in depth into it. Psalms 73. His name was Asaph. Anybody knows who Asaph is? No? Asaph was a young man that was, a, was one of the three appointed by King David to sing. He was a musician. He was a son of Gerson, and he was what as well? He was, he was the descendant of Gerson and son of Levi. So obviously he was part of the Levi uh, descendants. And you know he's also accredited for singing, uh, not only for David, but also for Solomon, King Solomon. He was there for when they, they had to um, do the, you know, for the first temple when Solomon had to commemorate it. Um, and, you know, this man, this young man was, you know, he was taught, you know, since the beginning when he was younger that God was good. God was always good no matter his circumstances, but he never actually went through life to that. Now, when he got older, when he actually got put to the real life, right, out there in the world, everything changed for him. He was in, in, in a lot of confusion. Why? Because he was, you know, he was looking at everything that was going through him right now uh, d- during that time, uh, the, the, the problems that he actually confronted from a wrong vintage point, from his own human perspective. And, you know, what happened was that uh, obviously he got confused. Um, and pretty much this song is going to teach us how to get our eyes out of our own circumstances, and place our squarely upon the Lord. Um, and he was ready to, you know, throw in the towel in a way. Uh, he was ready to give up the Lord just because, again, and then I feel like a lot of us have been put into that situation ourselves, right? When we're young, we are, you know, our parents try to cover us from the world as much as possible. But when we go out there in the world, you know, knowing the truth, the world at some way, it's going to teach us how things run. And sometimes you have to adapt knowing the truth. And that's the rough part about it, right? Um, and, 
but obviously without you know, taking, taking away what we know, what we know is the truth. So we're going to take a look at how, at the beginning, uh, in verse 1, somebody could read it for me. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Again, so we see here, what is sentiment? What do we see here? Right? He's standing in a solid ground. We see that you know, he's, he's being taught the right way, that the Lord is always with his people. Right? That's the first truth he's being taught. That's found in, in also in Psalms 84, 11. It says, For the Lord God is a son of shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good will be. The second truth will be, God blesses the pure. Right? That's what we know in Matthew 6, which is, Seek ye therefore the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Right? Um, now, in verse 2, it keeps on reading, and it says, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had dwelt, night slipped. Here's the part where you know, we see that his experience seems to contradict what he was being taught. Um, and then, from, and it keeps going, it says, The problem with Asaph is the same problem they all face today, right? We try to misinterpret the goodness of the Lord. We think that just by doing all the good things and, you know, being, you know, following the Ten Commandments, following, you know, the, the eight laws of health, um, God is already, like, pretty much, you know, we, we already expect from the Lord blessings. That He's already, like, since we're this good, goody-goody, we could call it that way, or we try, you know, to follow everything that is, it's been taught to us, um, that the Lord will obviously, and most, it has to, he has to actually uh, bless us. That's not the case. I mean, if you think about Job, for example, right? What, what would his logic be? Did he actually have a good time at some point? Do you remember the, the, the part where he has to suffer? You know, even, you know, it wasn't fun what he went through, right? Um, at the end, though, what happened? The Lord blessed him, but he had to go through a lot. Um, so for too many years, you know, I've seen or I've heard a lot of how, you know, not literally how I'm going to say it, but pretty much the health and the gospel and the wealth of the gospel is being taught and it's being preached. People have been led to believe that, you know, their, their lives are the kind of lives that, you know, that are, the Lord is obligated to do things. And this kind of teaching is obviously is, is wrong. And, you know, even though you're being placed in so much loads in your shoulders, so much things that are going through your life, uh, literally pretty much to a point where you kind of have to break, you feel like you're breaking up. Uh, isn't, nobody likes to go through those pleasant times in a way, right? Nobody likes that, right? But it's part of uh, enabling our character, improving our character, enabling us to grow with him, and it's necessary, correct? So we forget that the Lord is molding us into his image. So Asaph had to learn the truth, but I repeat, he, he did knew part of the truth, but I repeat, he kind of had to also learn what was out there. And at the same time, uh, go with, you know, with what the world, his experience on the world. So as a result of this, he was super confused. Now we're going to take a look into a couple of things that he was confused about. In verse 3, it says, For I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. It kind of bothered Asaph, right, that the wicked are prospered. Right? We see that in the world today. Right? We see how people are just, you know, they, they, they're living this life so filthy and nothing's happening to them. But us, so that we're trying to follow the Lord, we go through so many trials. Correct? So, um, verse 4. What does it say? There are no bands in the depth, but their strength is firm. So, he watches. He started watching how these people, how they, they live these lives wickedly, 
and you know they, how the eternity pretty much seems to not be there. There seems to be just going and going and going without ending. And he went amazed with the peace and how peacefully they lived, right? Um, in verse 5, it says, They are not in trouble as their, the other men, neither are they plagued like other men. He was astonished, pretty much, how wicked you know, they live. And their good times seem to roll and roll. Now, from verse 6 to 11, we will see the pride of the sinner, right? It says, Therefore pride compasses them, about a chain. Violence covers them as a garment. See here that because of their life they lived, they, he didn't see no type of, you know, where they were going to go. He was just looking at the current situation that he was on. Uh, and then that tends to lead, lead us ourselves, if we apply it to ourselves, uh, you know, our appearance. We always try to find or sometimes get um, distracted by the appearance. Uh, we let the world distract us from reaching our goal. Which, what is our goal, right? What is our goal? Salvation, right? So eternal life, Jesus Christ. And I remember a uh, brother, a couple of years, he preached about the character. How important is character when we reach to heaven? We have heard a lot of sermons about it. We have heard... Um, you know, how important it is to build it here. But one thing that caught my attention there was he said it was a passport to heaven. You know, that, that just kept in mind. And let us remember that the, the lives that we live right now is, are just temporary, right? The lives that are, those people are living, they seem that they're all wealthy and good and their lives are pretty good. And, you know, we are just being sunk ourselves trying to follow the Lord but others are not even know nothing about the Lord, are pretty good, well off. This is just temporary, right? Um, in verse 12, it says, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. He sees all this stuff. He looked at the life of, you know, how they were living without the Lord. Uh, in verse 14, he looked at how uh, his own share of sorrow, right? Um, and then in verse 15, if you take a look into it, he uh, says, If I say, I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. He was even ashamed of talking to others about this because he, he felt like he was going to guide them through the same thing that he was going through. And... Obviously, at some point, he felt like, what am I doing? Am I following the correct path here? You know, look at the life that I've lived since the beginning. I've tried to follow the Lord, and now he was brokenhearted, right? And so, so when Asaph saw all these things, he felt like, obviously, quitting on the Lord. He felt like giving up, you know. Even for us, when Charles... And lives begin on us, and we are tempted to think that, you know, the Lord is not there, that we're, we are better off living without the Lord. Um, there's no benefit on, the, on serving the Lord. The problem with this type of line of thinking is that, you know, life is viewed from a human perspective. Now, we look at life from a problem of our own personal human perspective. You know, what would happen to me? What would happen to, uh, you know, from, from now on? What would happen tomorrow? You know, what would it, how would it, this affect me? You know, how, how would I face this issue? You know, does, does the Lord care? Is the Lord even here? Does he even hear me? Right? Those are the things that we think about. And we tend to fall into that uh, path. And obviously this turns into a di distraction and later on, a disaster. It allows us to pretty much place ourselves in the wrong hands so if we, if we allow ourselves to fall into this, looking at life from a human perspective, um, you'll find yourself in a place where you'll begin to doubt the Lord, like I mentioned in the beginning. And, and obviously, that's a dangerous place to be. Now, from here, from verse 17 to 28, we'll see a huge difference. Now, notice this part, how everything changes. 
All right, from verse 17, what does it say? Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then let me So beginning of, of this verse, everything starts changing, right? Asa, Asa moves from a slippery ground to a human, from a human perspective to stepping away and going to the temple, heavenly perspective. He seems like, you know, he made a trip there to the temple, and there he talked to the Lord. He allowed the Lord to talk to him, and he pretty much let all his problems that he was facing, all that mindset, that he was all that cloudy mind that was going through him, he set it aside for a minute, right? Um, and then, as he did that, he turned from his own mindset to the Lord's mindset. Now, not, let us notice that some of the things that became clear to Asaph when he went to the temple. In verse uh, 17 through 20, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood in their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou casted them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As a moment they are utterly consumed with terror. As a dream, when one awaketh, so, o Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. So here's where he started noticing something different. Here's when he started realizing that the wicked were, what? At some point, we're gonna, they're going to end, right? Their lives may, you know, they may enjoy their lives here to the fullest and their existence, but there's a, a certain time that will end. Until the breath of life leaves their soul, that's it. There's no, there's no enjoyment, there's no happiness after that, right? So before we allow ourselves to become jealous of the wicked, you know, how, how well they're living, and, and consider the fact that, you know, heaven will be forever. And, and I mean, we need to come to the, to the right thinking ourselves, brethren. We may enjoy our lives today and think that, you know, even to ourselves, we might say we're Christians, but at the same time we are trying to follow or pursue those things here on earth. And, uh, you know, we might be enjoying the good life now and think that, you know, we made it. But the truth is, you know, we are just living in a borrowed, borrowed time. This time is not ours. And every time... Every day, time is being wasted. The Lord will come pretty soon, right? Um, one day, the clock will run out of us, and we'll find ourselves in death hell. Is that what you really want? No, Jesus died for us, to, obviously, to pay, to pay for us for our own sins. You know, and um, now he's calling us, you know, to come to him and give ourselves fully to him. But are, is that what we really want? Is that what we really want out of life? Is that really our perspective out of life? Now, in verse 21 to 22. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my veins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Here where he starts noticing himself, right? The foolishness of self. This is the part where he starts noticing how low he went. You know, he, he confesses the fact that he has been looking at everything, everything from a faulty eye, right? And he deals with it matter on his heart. There are many of God's children who will have to admit that, you know, we have looked into things the wrong way. And instead of trusting the Lord and putting and believing on him, we fall guilty in these circumstances and doubt in the Lord. I'm sure all of us have doubted the Lord at some point. Right? Let's be honest. We have been guilty of saying, you know, God doesn't care. He's not seeing me right now. Right? God doesn't hear me. And if He hear me, does He even know? Is He really powerful enough? You know? We might not say it out loud, 
but our actions could talk. So again, we, we all have been guilty, right, of saying, uh, of being on ASAPs uh, on that ground. You know, we, again, like I said, sometimes, most of the times when li like life trials afflict us and we feel, you know, like the whole world is falling upon our eyes, uh, we have to come and, you know, understand that the Lord, have faith on the Lord. It's hard to have faith if you don't, if you don't, you're not in the right mindset. It's, it's very easy to fall apart. Uh, and then on verse 22 it says, So foolishly was I, and ignorant, I was a beast before thee. We become like animals pretty much, right? Not knowing what's right and wrong. Just because of our human perspective. So as of now, we see already Asaph communing with the Lord. He's already, you know, began to see more clearly what's on his eyes and not to look look into the future not with his own eyes, right? Look into the future with the, the Lord's, the Lord's perspective. He came to realize that as a child of God, he possesses spiritual blessings that he needs to put into work. That everything that he enjoyed or he see people out there enjoying is just something that it's not going to last forever. So he needs to focus on that, on the Lord, what, he, what his truly love is at the beginning when he first learned it. Um, that is the greatest blessing that we are aware this morning. And the fact that the Lord will bless his children uh, beyond description after all this suffering that we go through on this earth. It means that we're never alone. It means that no, no matter how dark our soul might be at some point in our lives, you know, every situation, you know, we have been blessed with the Lord. He's going to be there with us. We might not see him. We might not, you know, I mean, see what exactly he's doing, but he's, he's right there with us. You know, he's described as a comforter. What is a comforter? According to John 14, 16, says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give me another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Again, this word comforter means a help, a, like a f help, right? A friend. Someone that is, is going to be there for you. Somebody that is going to help the discouraged one, the discouraged army. Um, and basically, uh, no matter our lives, what life presents to us, he will there be. He will, will be there, which is what? The Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is going to be there. In verse 24, it says, Thou shalt guide me with my counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Here we see, he starts seeing the protection of God. You see how everything shifts? How he first started to now, where he's at? Just by being in the presence of the Lord? Just being in the temple, talking to the Lord, Right? Asa recognizes here that even though, again, the storms of life might be around him, he understands that the direction of God is there. He knows that the God, if he abides on him, his life is going to be you know, protected from all evil. And if you think about it, we, the reason you're here today, you know, just think about it, how you got up this morning. The way you came to this, I mean, a lot of us haven't been to church a lot, like for a long time, but just the blessing of getting in that car, driving out here without an accident, the Lord is with you. He's right there with you. His guardian angel is next to you, right? Um, just knowing that, you know, knowing that the Lord is there always. You're blessed just to be alive. You're blessed just to breathe right now. A lot of people want that. So um, you got to think that, you know, a little more in depth. Like every day, let us not take every day for granted. Every day we have to just remember that. In verse 25 to 26, it says, Whom have I 
in heaven with thee, and there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. Again, he comes to start coming to a conclusion. Right? The, the Lord, you know, he's, he knows that the Lord is going to be there for him. He's starting to forget about the pleasures of the life of what others are thinking or going through. And he starts seeing the greatest joy of the blessing he has. Right? A personal relationship with the Lord himself. And he started realizing as well that he's also flesh, weak, a man that is nothing without the Lord. And we have to understand as children of God that, that whatever the Lord has desired for us is for our own good, right? Everybody here is, pre is presented with different scenarios that have to overpass everyone. And, you know, we have to overcome them somehow, one way or another. The Lord will never put you an obstacle that you cannot pass. We know that, right? He always gives you, He always tests you. Well, He allows Satan to test you for a purpose. And then again, let us not get ourselves or put our eyes in the lust of this world. Um, because then we will come dissatisfied at some point. You know, when we want nothing but God, we will assure that everything is going to be there for us. In verse 27 and 28, it says, For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Here's the part where he's pretty much already pleased with the Lord. This is where the joy comes, right? Uh, he knows, he understands how the victory of his trials. He understands where is he at, not from his own perspective again, right? We have to think that, no, we have to get to that place. We have to come to a place where our human perspective is not um, the main focus. You know, it's heavenly perspective. Basically, it boils down, it boils down to, uh, you know, where are we standing now? The question is, like, how do we get to this place? Okay. By prayer? Is it by reading the Bible? Is it by giving Bible studies? Is it by faith? We have to get to a place where we can trust the Lord. And, you know, in other words, you know, we have to be more like ourselves and believe on Him. And that is the first step, right? Just believe on Him and put in our full trust on Him. In conclusion... How many of us are pretty much have had that experience before when we kind of feel like we're slipping around from the Lord? I have. I have become an ASAP at some point. Uh, we sure do. You know, everyone has. If the soul is not being trained daily or is not being uh, put to test, it, it will never sharpen, right? Um, and I would like to challenge all of you that are, you know, that are presented with this trial sometimes to uh, commune with the Lord you know, and, and bring this situation to Him and ask Him to give you His eyes so that way uh, you will be able to see from his, his way, not yours. And ask Him to give you, you, know, you know, His understanding, His wisdom, because He will. But do we actually ask Him? We don't. We tend to always have our own conclusion of things because we think we're too smart. That's our natural thinking, right? We have to say, I have put my trust in the Lord. What does that mean? Put your trust in the Lord. You have to give fully, totally. Is 100% or zero. That's all, that's all he is. So it is my wish and prayer for all of you for, and for me as well. <clears throat> That if we are being pulled, like if we are being like being pulled in this type of situation, and are being guilty of this, um, let's start adopting his his presence. Let's start adopting his views, and make an effort today to, 
you know, see problems from now on from a heavenly perspective. You know, what would the Lord do, right, in this case? What, what would be his next step, you know? Do we actually kneel down every time we take a decision, right? Um, we have to come to all this understanding. I mean, we've, we've noticed this, and we've always been preached the same thing. But, you know, we tend to forget at times. And uh, let's not be guilty of this, you know. And the Lord will always be there, and He will prepare the way for us. And it will be done in God's way. That's my mission prayer. Amen.